Microphone check. What's crack, big dog? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE, and this is a continuation of our running back rankings. Yesterday, we did the elite tier, okay? So the title of this video might say top 12. However, we've already done one through six yesterday, so make sure you go watch that video first. That is the elite tier, the top six guys, first half of the first round that will get you all of the points in your lineup today we will continue down the road of running back ranking 7 through 12 i do want to say this video is probably going live around 11 30 a.m eastern time i am hopping on the underdog fantasy youtube channel at 12 30 p.m eastern time so if you want double dosage if you want to see this face right now for the next 15 minutes and then again in an hour make sure you hop over to the underdog fantasy youtube channel subscribe over there we're getting on for a little uh, a little trivia action they do a show each week where they bring somebody on i'm actually terrible at trivia I'm terrible at like pop culture trivia for some reason. My brain typically works pretty well, right? I have a very fucking big brain, very big brain. You can see I have a huge head, typically works well. However, when I'm put in a situation where I need to do like trivia and I need to think on the spot about random pop culture things, it shrivels up. It's like it becomes a little fucking raisin. I don't know why. So I'm going to be honest. I'm, I don't really get nervous going on podcasts or doing guest type of shit, but this has got me in the press a little bit. So they're doing a trivia, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. I will send out the link send it out via text message so make sure you sign up for our texting platform whatever all that shit will be linked down below half of it's nfl and half of it is entourage related they they asked us to choose a a niche topic and i was like what more does a basic uh white guy know than than uh the entourage tv show so i said fucking run it up entourage johnny drama fucking mean was when i made jess mancini ride her bike home after i her. all right that's enough for me we're gonna tuck our shirts in we're not gonna tuck my shirt in because i have jeans on and all right fuck it we're gonna do it Feeling like a fucking farmer with this fit on. Farmer fit check. Stop yelling. Let's eat. Again, make sure you go check out yesterday's video if you missed the first six running back rankings. We will continue on down the list with my number seven overall ranked running back in the 2021 fantasy football season. All of these rankings are pretty much going to be half PPR. That's the league setting I play in. Adjust accordingly to your league settings. Number seven, Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor, Indianapolis Colts. We did a video a couple weeks back breaking down Jonathan Taylor in depth, right? A lot of moving parts here, but he was fantastic over the second half of the year. Once they started giving him the touches that we knew he deserved to get, he was a monster, okay? From weeks 1 through 10, they they just didn't utilize the guy for whatever reason. From weeks 11 through the divisional playoffs, he was another monster. He went from 16 touches a game up to... 23 touches a game. He went from 43.5% of the snaps up to 64% of the snaps. Now, again, there is going to be a lot of moving parts here. We have no more Rivers. We have Carson Wentz coming in. Naeem Hines still going to be playing on third down. Marlon Mack coming back from the injury. Torn Achilles usually zaps explosiveness, so I'm not too worried about a guy named Marlon Mack. At the end of the day, I'm not delusional, though. I understand that Naeem Hines is still there, and he's still going to play, and Jonathan Taylor is not going to be an 80%, 85% snap guy. You know, we have people taking Jonathan Taylor above C-Mac in Dynasty, and I'm just not there, okay? I just, I just don't think he's going to be the guy on every down for the Indianapolis Colts, but once they let him run free again, from week 11 through the divisional playoffs, we saw what he could be. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm trying to look at, like, reasonable projections for Taylor. What kind of workload can we expect? If you look at the Colts' backfield work last year, they had 409 carries. And depending on the rate in which Jonathan Taylor sucks up those carries, we're going to be looking at this many carries. We assume that this offense is going to see, you know, 410 carries again. That's how many that last year. I think it's reasonable to project them around the same number. If you give Jonathan Taylor a reasonable rate, 62%, 65%, 68%, 70%, these are the number of carries that he would get if, if you're going to give Jonathan Taylor 280 carries like good things are going to come from it you're going to have a lot of home run plays you're going to have a lot of those being goal line plays and as I've been saying if you're drafting a guy like Jonathan Taylor you're not expecting C-Mac or Cook numbers he just doesn't have that elite ceiling at least this year right now in redraft that those guys have he's not going to be in there you know catching 50 passes that's just not going to be his game you're drafting him to be Derrick Henry last year you're drafting him to be Zeke in the first two years that he came in not see a ton of targets not catch a ton of balls but running behind an elite offensive line getting goal line opportunities having that home run ability okay last year the team saw 24 goal line carries and they were eighth in overall points per game okay eighth 28 points per game that's four touchdowns a game if taylor is going to see 18 of those 24 goal line carries 
scores on like 11 of them or some shit, which is not unreasonable. You're looking at a very, very, very big year, okay? So you could equally acknowledge that he's not going to be an 80% player, but he's also going to be very, very good for fantasy. So I have Jonathan Taylor at number seven. Right after him, we have another of our softy seconds, Cam Akers of the Los Angeles Rams. Now, this is going to be a questionable one, and I understand why you would have a guy that I have at number nine in Nick Chubb over Cam Akers. But here's the problem. Here's here's what I'm looking at, right? In last in, in yesterday's video, which I really, really again suggest that you guys go watch. Um, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Just scroll down a little bit, hit the big huge red button that says subscribe. You'll be getting shit like this every single day to your face holes. Cam Akers, um, again, I did an in-depth breakdown of, of Cam Akers for this upcoming year, which will also be linked down below in the description. This is going to be just a very quick, basic background of my top 12 running back rankings. Whereas I talked about, like, you, you don't pass on guys like C-Mac or Dalvin Cook because the upside of being a league winning running back is there. It's the reason in redraft, like, I shoot for upside in the first round. I know a lot of people are like, you know, play it safe, get your floor guys, and then work from there. I like to shoot for upside. I want to win my mother fucking league so Cam Akers is a guy who in this Rams offense was dominant over the last six weeks of the season last year was he dominant in the efficiency department no he was not but I'll take volume for a one-year sprint and this offense is going to be very good most people don't realize this but the Rams run blocking line the Rams run blocking line was top three in the NFL last year there there's no one better that I mean Sean McVay has been an absolute fucking genius mad genius when it comes to revamping the offensive line right because they were terrible then they became really good and then they kind of fell off and now they're really good again and you're bringing Matt Stafford and the holes are going to be fucking glorious over there Grand Canyon type shit for Cam Akers so we're looking at Cam Akers probably being more efficient definitely seeing a lot of passes I mean you look at what Stafford's done historically with his running backs DeAndre Swift was on pace for like 65, 70 targets last year as a rookie. And we've always, you know, we've seen Theo Riddick was in Detroit with Matt Stafford for like a fucking eternity. So I think Cam Akers has a real chance to be, um, to, to have like real RB1 overall upside. Maybe his floor, so this is, this is what you have to get from, from what I'm saying here. There's absolutely a risk with Akers. The upside of Akers, I think, is greater than a guy that just gets a lot of carries. However, the likelihood of him finishing as like a top five running back might be lower. So there's risk and reward. Like, give me the ceiling for a little bit of a dip in the floor. That's why I love a guy like Cam Akers, right? O-line is good. Malcolm Brown, who led the backfield in both receptions and targets, gone. I just think it's a it's a beautiful opportunity. And we saw what McVay did with Todd Gurley. And I think they're going to run that kind of shit. Bike and Cam Akers is going to be fantastic. Go. Yeah, I was editing this. Maybe my brain is not as big as I thought it was. I was editing this, and I realized I just completely skipped number nine. So I went bike while I was editing it to film this again. So I apologize. There's like a random jump in the uh, video. Oh, I have my glasses on this time around. FelixGray.com forward slash Nick Ercolano. Get you a nice little pair on there for blue light glasses. Nick Chubb is my number nine. Uh, again, I think he's about as safe as they come in the first round. Very much the point that I made in yesterday's video about Derrick Henry and what I said about Jonathan Taylor or whatever it is. Uh, in 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 pass catching type leagues, PPR leagues and stuff, the upside of these guys just does not hit the upside of guys who who can catch a ton of passes. Like Nick Chubb's going to be phenomenal. He played in 12 games last year, 1,200 yards in scrimmage, 12 touchdowns, one of the best run blocking lines in the entire NFL. Second year in the offense, he's going to be unstoppable. He's the, he's probably second best pure runner in the NFL behind Henry possibly the first you know what you're getting in Nick Chubb you're getting an extremely high floor player with a nice ceiling probably 1500 1600 yards from scrimmage could score you know 12 plus touchdowns he did score 12 plus touchdowns last year uh so that's that's what you're getting from Nick Chubb can he explode and, and run for 1800 yards yes but we also saw what Derrick Henry did with 2000 rushing yards okay um, and it just wasn't enough to put him above guys like Kamara. It wasn't enough to put him above Cook. It wasn't enough to put him above a guy like C-Mac in the few games that he did play. So that's my one problem with Nick Chubb, and it's not even really a fucking problem. It's just like you're the best of what we can get from Nick Chubb is a little bit limited because Kareem Hunt is there, and he's just not going to catch that many passes. We've seen it year and year and year and year and year over. Uh, Nick Chubb's ceiling for pass catching is probably around like 45-ish catches or maybe even like target you know what I mean it's just it's just not there and if you're not getting those touches it becomes a problem eventually over the course of the season but listen I would not fault anyone for drafting Nick Chubb in the first round he's going to anchor in that RB1 slot for you that's why he's my number nine ranked running back let's move it to numero 10 my number 10 ranked running back is Austin Eckler, man. And we'll start off with this tweet from Mike Brown. If you remove Austin Eckler's week four injury game in which he played just three snaps, his PPR fantasy points per game jumps to 18.1. That's fewer than just C-Mac, Kamara, 
Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, and Aaron Jones last year. If you remove his week one with Tyrod Taylor, Eckler jumps to 19.2 fantasy points per game. The setup is beautiful. They don't have a real piece of competition for Austin Eckler. They don't have. They, they tried to do it with Josh Kelly. Larry Roundtree is a worst version of Josh Kelly and he was like a seventh round pick this year in draft maybe sixth round I forget but they're going to force some fat guy onto the field and it's it's not going to be pretty for whoever tries to get on there the big thing here is this offense like honestly I wouldn't I would not fault anyone for having Austin Eckler ranked as high as like number five or six this year Austin Eckler with Justin Herbert under center was on pace for like 135 targets this offensive line bringing Corey Lindsley an all pro center from the Packers is going to be very very much improved they use their first round pick on an offensive lineman Justin Herbert is obviously looking like the second motherfucking coming so this offense is going to be smooth they're going to be up tempo they're going to have a high pace it's just it's just there there aren't a lot of red flags here except for the goal line carries we don't care about the, the in between the 20s carries give Austin Eckler 12 carries a game whatever the problem comes when Austin Eckler gets down by the goal line they did not give him goal line carries last year the same thing happened two years ago when Melvin Gordon was holding out Austin Eckler was a beast for the first month of the season as soon as Melvin Gordon came back those last 12 games of the season I think Austin Eckler had three goal line carries last year Austin Eckler had one goal line carry once he came back from injury different offense different coaches maybe they use him more on the goal line I think they should he's kind of like an Aaron Jones where he's good at scoring from the goal line that is the risk that you take with Austin Eckler <clears throat> he might catch 100 passes but he might only score three to four rushing touchdowns he also might catch six to seven receiving touchdowns which he did two years ago um so there is absolutely risk and reward i just think the ceiling for an all Eckler's is actually very 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 high if you're playing in ppr leagues if you're playing in half ppr leagues because he's going to put up five six catches per game and we know he's wildly efficient on his touches the yardage should not be a problem for austin eckler to rack and stack okay we'll move on to my number 11 ranked running back this year it is antonio gibson of the washington football team okay Gibson uh, another guy that we broke down in our softy second series all these guys that we talked about uh Antonio Gibson Cam Akers Jonathan Taylor that I said we already broke down I'm gonna link those videos in which I go in depth on all three of those players for like eight ten minutes a rip if you want to get the in-depth analysis on them but Antonio Gibson I mean it's ex it's extremely extremely obvious at this point the upside is you know an elite fantasy running back he's a guy who can break away 80 yard runs he's got the size he's got the speed he can catch the ball what are they going to use him for? We don't know. Third downs, J.D. McKissick outsnapped uh, Antonio Gibson. I don't have the numbers top ahead, but it was something like 185 to like 30 last year, which becomes a problem because on third downs, it's when a lot of people catch passes. We also have the toe injury, right? The turf toe thing. I know people are like, it's not that serious. It cost him games at the end of last season, and it's still bothering him four months later. This could be a problem. We have doctors that are telling us there is a likelihood of re-injury. If he re-injures his toe in the first or second week of the season and it requires surgery, which obviously he has a much higher risk of needing the surgery than a player who doesn't have the turf toe injury, you're going to be without Gibson for four months. You're going to be without Gibson for the entire fantasy season. You just lost your entire second round pick. His ADP is starting to correct itself a little bit and is starting to move bike a little bit based on the toe injury news. Um, but Gibson, you know, listen, if he could stay healthy, obviously his upside is really, 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 really high because he could become a three down player that can do it all and can hit the home run and can play on the goal line. And we saw how involved he was. He's going to be the goal line back. So if this offense is good, which I expect it to be a little bit better with Ryan Fitzpatrick slinging the ball, they're bringing De'Ami Brown, they're bringing Curtis Samuel. So they should be able to move the ball downfield pretty easily. Uh, in a division where I think everybody's going to be scoring a lot of points. Philly's uh, defense fucking stinks. Dallas's defense stinks. The Giants have a pretty underrated defense, but they have an improved offense, so I think they'll be putting up a little bit of a little bit of point action there. Uh, Gibson, listen, the, the ceiling is really, really fucking high. I do think this is a situation where you need to factor in some of the risks as well. You don't just go in blind. I know I talked about shooting for upside with Cam Akers. I also think Cam Akers' floor is higher because I'm not <clears throat> as concerned with him coming into the fucking season with a turf toe injury, okay? So that is a concern for me monitor reports very closely on antonio gibson and that turf toe number 12 who do y'all have as number 12 i know you're gonna say i'm disrespecting aaron jones i'm you know put some fucking respect on aaron jones's name whatever whatever i'm not gonna fucking respect aaron jones's name right now until we know what the other aaron in green is doing so number 12 and this shit hurted it's Joe Mixon of the Bengals, man. It's Joe Mixon. And listen, there was no one more more vocal about being out on Joe Mixon last year than myself. The risks were very apparent. 
Um, and that turned out to be a good move. This time around, I'm okay using his second round pick on Joe Mixon. Okay. Um, and I tweeted this out the other day. I was like, listen, if you like Joe Mixon, just draft Cam Akers. They're the same player. They have the size, they have the speed, they have the athleticism. They're not super efficient. They're not super shifty. I mean, they get, they get it done by making guys miss in a different uh, variety of ways, but they're the same player. When you look at just a pure athlete and production profile, Cam Akers, better offense, better offensive line. That's the concern for Joe Mixon. Last year, the concern for Joe Mixon was that he continually was regressing as a pass catcher. The targets per game, the receptions per game, the efficiency were going down year over year. And you guys didn't want to hear it. You guys were pretending that that wasn't happening, but it was a motherfucking fact. Okay. That was the case with Joe Mixon. My concern was that they were going to continuously play Gio Bernard on third downs. And that's what happened. And then Joe Mixon had some fake injury, whatever, missed the entire year got the contract extension to be a workhorse though and i think this is the year that they finally let him do his thing because geo is out of town geo is in tampa bay which means joe mixon can play on third downs is he going to i don't know the 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 reason that i would much rather trust him this year than last year on third downs is they don't actually have a pass catcher in that backfield it's literally samaji p ryan samaji p ryan looks like he fucking ate eddie lacy at this point okay so samaji p ryan's a guy who probably going to average like 3.2 yards per carry not a pass catcher joe mixon is a better pass catcher so i expect him to catch upwards of like 45 to 50 passes this year which will make him an easy rb1 because last year before he got hurt he was averaging over 20 carries per game he'll be the goal line guy the problem again their offensive line is going to stink but i mean the weapons are so good that maybe it opens up the holes for joe mixon risky pick of course because it's been like 40 years and everyone's gonna be like he already broke out listen like running for a thousand yards not like if if you're gonna be taking Joe Mixon with your first round pick, what he's been doing in fantasy football over the last four years is not good. Stop trying to back his ass up with mediocre ass stats. If we want to use a first or second round pick on Joe Mixon, he needs to break not just out. He needs to break the freak out. Okay, and I'm expecting some good numbers for Joe Mixon. He feels like a very high floor player, and this is the first season in which I feel like he can somewhat touch the ceiling. Okay, he's been working on his vertical jump, and the ceiling has been put down from like 12 feet to 10 and a half feet and he's an NFL athlete so he should be able to touch 10 and a half feet I feel like he's going to be closing in on his ceiling this year because the volume will be so damn high and he finally can play on third downs all right that's what I got for y'all today if you enjoyed the video make sure you hit the thumbs up button make sure you subscribe to the channel and make sure you head over to underdog fantasy right after this to subscribe to their channel and hit me up at 12 30 p.m eastern time in the live chat i will be barking at y'all thank you for joining me we'll see you tomorrow as well on fade the public everything tight ends breakout sleepers uh busts all that good all that good busty ass shit i'll see y'all later goodbye